Hi, uh, welcome all to this talk. Uh, so today we'll be presenting how to run secure and isolated workloads via Bosch. So I have with me Subankar, my colleague, and myself, I'm Shashank. So we'll run you over uh, how we have done and run secure workloads uh, of the Bosch-based deployments. So just to set the agenda at a high level, so when we talk of Bosch-based deployment, we'll take an example of Service Fabric Broker, which is deployed as a Bosch deployment today. And we give you an overview on what is Service Fabric. Then there are certain requirements for Service Fabric where we need to deploy certain extensions to it, which means there will be third-party code or scripts which will be running as part of Service Fabric code execution. So this is where the challenges are, and how do we secure those kind of workloads? What are the challenges we see is what we cover in this talk. We will show you a demo on what kind of possible attack vectors we see when we allow custom code to be executed on the Bosch-based virtual machine. And then what is the mitigation for the same? How do we mitigate this, and what are the best practices around doing this or mitigating these uh, attack vectors? And then we finally talk about uh, what is the roadmap and the future for these uh, security extensions we are trying to develop. Over and above all, we also demonstrate the actual attack vectors, what we saw, and then also the mitigations for the same. So at a high level, this is uh, how Service Fabric looks like. So let me try this. So you see on the top the consuming environment, which is Cloud Foundry, sorry, KTS, and other platforms. And this is the piece of Service Fabric. We say Service Fabric Broker++ plus plus because there are OSB and extension APIs on top, like Backup and Restore. So the way it works is basically, so you have an API server sitting here. So Service Fabric, when you trigger a deployment or create CF Service Create as an example, so Service Fabric puts a custom resource definition into the API server. So here we use the Kubernetes API server standalone mode, not the Kubernetes itself. So it talks to the etcd where the CRD is persisted. It also generates an event back where you see these components like the Docker operator, the Bosch operator, and the KTS operator. So there's a specific reason why we did it this way. So in the initial release of Service Fabric, what we were supporting is only these two kind of deployments, the Docker and the Bosch. But with this framework in place, we are able to support much more flexible provisioning mechanisms, like you can add a KTS operator and deploy into Kubernetes. But the talk is not about that. Talk is about primarily the Bosch side of it, where how do we secure the deployments done via Bosch? How do we secure the service fabric deployment itself? So this is the uh, whole user flow I'm going to talk about today. So why is the need of doing this? So when we were uh, building service fabric, and after a certain uh, point in time, people asked, how do I extend service fabric? Right. So in the deployment lifecycle, is there an ability to introduce some code which I want to get executed. As an example, you have a deployment manifest. Can I modify the manifest a little bit? Can I inject some credentials into it? Right? So these are the kind of use cases which emerged. And this is where we brought in the concept of saying the third party extensions or the plugins. We call them the deployment hooks, where we say that you have the ability to introduce a deployment hook, execute a deployment hook as part of the life cycle of service fabric deployment workflow. So typical use cases, as I said, center around the manifest manipulation, but there are many things you can do if you are not checked or controlled, rather. So what can happen possibly, right? So if you have the challenges uh, of introducing a third-party code running on the control plane, which is service fabric, what a rogue code or a rogue agent or a rogue plugin, rather, can do? So you can see he can inject a malware can cause denial of service on the service fabric component. So he can launch a denial of service like a slow loris on the HTTP endpoint on the service fabric broker itself, which means he can cause an outage of the whole deployment chain. Then uh, there are components which service fabric talks to. If you have an agent which is uncontrolled and unchecked, he can also bring down the other components which have interfacing with service fabric itself. Then there are mechanisms like ptrace where you can change the binary of the or the executable which is running. So a malicious code can just do a process following or change the binary of the service fabric itself, and it can go totally unaware. So what service fabric doesn't control? So we don't control what are the qualities of these extensions. I mean, you can have a limit to checking the static code checks and other things, but some things we will show in the demo can just pass through. 
So how do I check what kind of resource usage a specific hook is doing? What kind of system calls it is making? Is it trying to load a rootkit and trying to elevate set privileges? We have no clue. There are mechanisms like using LD preload to divert the system calls itself. So all these mechanisms can totally go unchecked. So basically the idea is introduce a sm small code can just bring down service fabric or the Bosch deployment which you are running. So now I go over to a small demo on what are the possible attack vectors we see here. So over to Subankar. Thanks, Jason. Am I audible? Okay. So uh, as Shashank mentioned, so we had this use case of uh, running third-party extension code uh, as part of the creation lifecycle. But we also wanted to make sure that uh, nothing can go wrong and somebody cannot uh, introduce a rogue code that can bring down the whole control plane of Service Fabric Broker. So we would show a couple of demo how it can basically bring down and then we will show how what were the solutions that we brought in and how we solve the problem. So, so the first demo. Yeah, so the first demo will be uh, about a uh, reverse shell. So in just let me explain the uh, pane over here. So I have the local machine from where I will create the service instances. And in the middle I have the rogue machine or the attacker machine where I will basically open up the uh, reverse shell. And I have the third uh, pane where I have uh, logged into the broker VM, the service fabric broker VM. And I will show that what uh, the attacker could do in the uh, broker VM. So let us see uh, what can happen uh, in this uh, scenario. <coughs> so uh, in the beginning, we are just uh, doing an IP config, IF config, just to show that uh, all these machines have a different uh, IP address. As you can see, the first one has 172.17.0.1. The second one has a different IP address, which is a private IP, uh, which is the attacker machine in this case. And uh, again, we go to the broker VM and we do an IF config. And uh, here the IP address is 10.11.252.10. So the idea of this attack is that uh, this is the attacker machine, but uh, executing a deployment hook here on this side he will be able to obtain a shell here, which is the start of the attack, and basically then you can do much more on this. So I will just uh, uh, create a watch on the monit process that is running. So in this case, the monit process, the Bosch monit process that is running is Service Fabric Broker. So over here, you can see that the process is running, and it also shows the IP address, just to show that uh, we can actually log into this system. Uh, on the middle pane, what we are doing is we are opening a netcat server and we are just listening to this particular port. Now uh, what we have is we have some rogue uh, script which is part of the service fabric deployment hook. So the moment somebody creates a service, this script will be invoked. So let us see what it can do. So we will just do a CF marketplace to see uh, the services. So we have a blueprint service which is a uh, demo service and we have uh, X small plan we will be creating a service instance for that plan yeah so I am doing a create service uh, to create a service instance of blueprint of this specific plan so as soon as I do this the script will be executed and you would be able to see that the reverse shell is uh, yeah so in the in the second pane, you could see that the reverse shell has uh, obtained connections, and it has basically obtained a shell uh, of broker. So if I do a who am I, I get a VCAP user because the process is running as VCAP. And I do an if config, and that's why I had the IP address on the third uh, pane also. So you could see that the if config uh, actually shows the IP address of the broker. So this is the start of the attack, as Shashank said. Now what it could do? So it could do process uh, tracing. So you can do simple PS minus EF, 
and you could probably guess that the process would have something like service fabric broker so you could grep with that you get a list of processes and you could do a uh, uh, kill minus nine of all these processes because these are running with VCAP privileges so you could actually kill all these processes. So uh, in this demo we are killing one of these processes and you could see that the Bosch uh, process on the, the monit process on the other side will go down. So this is basically you cause the outage. Yeah. So as soon as the monit process goes down what it means is your Bosch deployment of service fabric broker goes down that means your control plane for creating a service goes down, which is an outage for your uh, platform, right? So this is what you could do uh, with uh, with uh, a reverse shell with a uh, with a rogue code. Be just to show like what kind of code you can write to yeah. just obtain a reverse yeah, shell. Yeah. So uh, I mean, if you are thinking that writing this kind of code is a very big uh, thing. It is not actually. So this is what I actually wrote in the uh, script. It's this very small Python uh, code which runs as a shell script basically. Um, so what it is doing is it is just creating a socket and uh, after that it is just redirecting the stream. And with that it opens up a, um, a reverse shell on the attacker uh, machine. So this is the kind of attack that uh, can happen. So one more example that we want to show is uh, the rootkit example. So we found out one of the example rootkit and uh, this is the code that you could uh, run to basically gain uh, root access. So you could be any user if you have a privilege to um, load a kernel module. So using INS mod you can uh, load any rootkit and after that you have the root access. So you could do anything. You could do monit stop all and destroy all the processes. And that's probably the least you could do. So we will show a demo for that also. Uh, so again, uh, we have the local machine and we have the broker process running on the uh, right hand side. So you could see this is the script that I showed uh, that will be executed as part of the life cycle of the, uh, uh, of the create service. And again, I would uh, uh, run a watch on the broker process. So, and again, uh, similarly how we did for the other uh, previous uh, demo, we will try to create a service instance for the same blueprint uh, instance. And that will again deploy the deployment yeah. hook. So that will again call the deployment hook and will execute that piece of code of loading the uh, root uh, root kit and getting the uh, access, uh, the root access, and it will do a monit stop all. And uh, as soon as it does a monit stop all, it uh, brings down all the Bosch processes, all the monit processes. You can see the service fabric broker process has become not monitored and again it will cause uh, outage and uh, uh, your uh, control plane will be down. So basically what you are trying to tell is that there is an ability to install a kernel module via the hook. right? And then that kernel module itself is a rootkit which allows a user to elevate his privileges to do root and then do a monit stop all on the other processes running on that virtual machine. Exactly. And uh, uh, also one more thing that we could uh, uh, do is uh, fork boom. I mean that is a very common thing that we have probably done uh, during our childhood coding. So here what we are doing, uh, we have the broker VM and we are checking the number of processes that it is running. So currently if you see, overall in this VM there are like 149 processes running. So if you don't know about fork bomb, what it does is it exponentially creates uh, processes using the fork process uh, system call. And then uh, uh, as soon as the number of process that it creates grows uh, so high that your resource consumption becomes so high, your VM could crash and it could uh, become uh, unresponsive and eventually it will crash. So let's try to do that. So again, uh, through the CF create service, it will invoke uh, this particular code. 
Um, again, this code also, writing this code is very easy. You could find it on internet. It's just a one line of script that you could run and uh, which brings down the whole uh, uh, virtual machine. Uh, yeah, so you could see now on the right hand side, it is uh, the number of processes increasing at a rapid rate. And uh, at one point in time, even the uh, watch process itself will will be killed and uh, eventually the virtual machine she will like be killed. the PIDs here. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, so we, we saw the, the problems that we have, right? So, uh, our uh, intention was to still provide this flexibility for people or for the service owners to add uh, uh, this capability of uh, writing custom code before the actual Bosch deployment happened. So what are the solutions? So the solution is to sandbox these processes so that it cannot affect the other process. So uh, what you could do, you could apply uh, resource limits in terms of memory or CPU or network, or you could restrict the system calls. So for that, you could use SecCom, and uh, you could also then uh, filter some certain uh, uh, system calls, and you can disable some certain uh, system calls like a loading rootkit or probably opening up a TCP connection, something or like disabling that. disabling clone to be done from a script to launch such kind of an attack like the fork bomb. So uh, also what you could do is uh, you can have uh, fine-grained uh, mandatory access control like AC Linux, which is a Linux utility, and you could also have it as part of it so that you could define uh, fine-grained user controls. And of course, uh, Linux capabilities are one of those things that you could use. Uh, so in our case, there was an uh, there was a case where we had to, we had to deploy many service inst instances and these service instances should not look at each other right they should be restricted so that they can only see each other and not others so we had to yeah, manipulate the ip tables for that but you uh, you don't want to be root and manipulate the ip tables so for that we use the linux capabilities and only enable uh, manipulating the ip tables capability and not the entire root access so this is something that you could do um, so for setting up uh, resource limits, so uh, in the Bosch uh, Monet script that we have, you can actually define U limits. So it's a bash utility that you have, and you can define different uh, limits like memory, CPU, number of open files, uh, number of uh, connections, etc., which ultimately uses the R limit, uh, which is a system uh, system call. And also, of course, you have the uh, uh, C groups, which are a Linux kernel feature to basically limit and uh, also um, a, uh, isolate the resources between the set of processes. So uh, coming back to SecCom, so uh, as I said, you could actually filter the uh, system calls that you want to allow. And this is what we did, uh, we used uh, for our use case. So uh, SecComp is basically a very efficient way of filtering the, uh, filtering the uh, list of system calls that you want to allow. You can just configure it, and you can provide the list of system calls that you want to allow, and others will be denied automatically. And uh, it's especially useful if you're running untrusted uh, third-party programs. Uh, we have used a libseccom, which is a, uh, uh, it's a C uh, uh, library uh, that you can use and you can filter uh, unwanted uh, system calls. And in Service Fabric, we, can, we have a configurable mechanism of basically allowing the uh, system calls. So our approach is to deny all and then whitelist certain system calls which are needed for a specific process to be done. So uh, this uh, SecComp actually is coming from uh, a long time uh, since uh, it was introduced with Linux uh, 2.6.12, and it was part of the CPU sharing uh, program. And uh, uh, it's a very, uh, a very nice tool. I'll, and along with SecComp, if you use uh, features like namespace and capabilities, you could actually restrict your process so that it does not cause havoc to the whole uh, ecosystem. So, 
we will show the exact uh, attacks uh, demo that we did and we we will show that how it was solved using uh, seccom so we will show the first uh, first one which was the reverse shell uh, attack so uh, again uh, the same pane and i will open up uh, the netcat uh, process on the uh, attacker vm uh, in the middle and then we will see what happens so on the third uh, pane we will show the uh, the settings for uh, seccom so as i said it's configurable and you can list the list of uh, system calls you want to sorry um, I'll, I'll get it yeah list No, this is not the one. Sorry. Yep. Sorry. Um, yeah. So let's come back. Yeah. So as I said, uh, we we have a setting uh, which is uh, configurable, and you can list down the list of system calls that you want to uh, 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 enable. So as you can see here, you have a flag enable syscall filters, which is if you make it true, then it will be in effect. And then you have some whitelisted syscall. You can list all the syscalls that you want to whitelist, and those will be allowed. And anything else other than that will be uh, will not be allowed. So in this case, uh, we have the reverse shell where you would need a TCP connections to be open, right? So uh, uh, we don't uh, allow this. And uh, we will see that how uh, service fabric deployment hook process blocks that. So we open up the uh, netcat process on the uh, uh, attacker VM. And then we try to create the service instance. And these policies can be applied per process. Yeah. So as you can see, as soon as I created the service instance, previously you, uh, you could see there was a reverse shell already created on the second VM. Now it's not there, right? So what happened? Something must have happened which has blocked it. So let us check the service fabric uh, log for the deployment hook process. So we could go to the uh, log and in the log, we would see there is a bad system call uh, exception that has got from the uh, uh, from the filter, and it has basically blocked from uh, uh, executing that uh, particular script. So this is how you could uh, block a, uh, a specific script that is uh, not supposed to run. Uh, uh, in the similar scenario earlier, uh, where we showed that. Uh, uh, the rootkit was uh, it was able to load the rootkit so in this case again uh, we show that uh, the settings is enabled and we have some whitelisted uh, limited set of uh, syscalls which is uh, 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 only allowed and when we try to create the service instance so basically you block the init module or the loading of the kernel module yeah here. exactly so the ins mod uh, will be blocked and then uh, uh, when we try to create the service instance previously it was able to bring down the process uh, now that would not happen so only the creation probably would uh, ultimately fail so it would later say that the creation failed uh, but then uh, you would still uh, not be able to uh, acquire the um, root access and uh, similarly here also we can see that uh, in the log you will have a certain uh, a bad system call um, uh, log which basically restricts the process from uh, getting executed yeah so uh, this is about the uh, uh, about the demo that we have now uh, where do we see uh, this is getting used and um, uh, we have uh, sort of uh, other use cases that is happening in the uh, CF community. So uh, you probably would know uh, there's a Bosch BPM release which is uh, also targeted towards uh, process isolation and uh, uh, making sure that the process uh, runs uh, in its own um, uh, in its own namespace 
and uh, um, it uses C groups for, for, for achieving the resource isolation. And also it has the ability to um, uh, define a resource limit like open files or the memory that you could use. So uh, um, over the period of time where we were developing this uh, seccomp based uh, uh, approach, we also saw that uh, the BPM also was doing uh, in parallel something similar. So we could uh, also use some of the capabilities that BPM has. So uh, running a Bosch job on BPM also is very easy. And uh, you could get uh, things like the resource isolation and uh, applying the resource limit. Uh, what BPM also provides is uh, through Linux capabilities, you can also uh, configure the grant for a certain uh, user or a certain process. Uh, so you could also have uh, Linux capabilities and the list of capabilities defined and uh, the process will have those capabilities only enabled. So uh, we see that along with BPM and along with SecComp, uh, you could also have the list of uh, system calls that you can block and you, uh, that could be an efficient way to run uh, third party extension code or third party extension. Or even script. the normal Bosch deployments in a hardened way. Yeah. So, yeah, so this is all we wanted to uh, discuss and talk. So if you have some questions, we can take up. Anybody have any questions? Also, let's give them a hand. Thank you so much. But also, I can take anybody if you have any questions. So if you want to uh, have some discussion, uh, we have uh, all the contacts given here. Service Fabric is also an open source uh, incubation project. We have given the links for all the GitHub repositories and our Slack channel. So you could also talk to us uh, over there. Uh, maybe. So would it be possible to reach the same level of isolation with Bosch BPM uh, now? Or Yes. Mm -hmm. So when you say same level, you mean the work we have done? So wh what you have done? Yes. Yes. Okay. Thank you. So at the time when we were doing it was in an alpha stage. So that's the reason. I think now it's in a stage where uh, you could also use uh, BPM. So for some of our boss jobs, we were also using it, and we saw it's quite, quite good. Um, so in in uh, uh, along with that, I think for sub, uh, I mean, if you have use case of restricting the uh, system calls, so we could also use uh, something like seccomp or libseccomp to basically restrict uh, certain. So I think one calls. thing we are not sure of is the Linux capability part yet. We have not checked on the Bosch BPM side. So how do you, let's say, he talked about the IP tables use case where you want a process just to apply IP tables. He cannot do more than that. So you have fine-grained security applied via the uh, cap Linux capabilities feature. So we are not sure whether Bosch BPM and in which way it does it. So maybe there, may not be there. So. Great, thanks a lot. Thank you. Thanks.